everyone. This is Tabitha Lord from Book Club Babel, and today I am so pleased to have Bethany Harvey on our podcast today. Bethany just finished and published a memoir called Dipped in It, and it was a very um, emotional read. It's a very beautiful read, um, and I think it's something very dear to her heart. And since I know her personally, I was really excited when she agreed to um, appear on our podcast today. So, or on our video podcast, whatever we call these things. Um, so, Bethany, welcome. Thank you for being here. And, Thank you. Um, Happy to be here. Yay. And so first off, congratulations. Just tell us a little bit about it, it published on what date? Where can we find your book? Let's get that right out there front and center. First of all, you know, give you a little marketing boost. Yeah. So it came out on Friday the 9th. And it is definitely available on barnesandnoble.com. We actually hit number seven on the bestseller list on Friday. Yay. Congratulations. Crazy. Um, and it is starting to be stocked in smaller independent bookstores. And Barnes Noble has reached out to us about stocking it in some of their brick and mortar stores, but I don't really know when that's happening or where that's happening. But I do know that you can either get it on barnesandnoble.com or uh, if you walk into any independent bookstore, they can get it uh, for you. So right. it's it's in their wholesale catalog online and they can get it for you within a few days. It's pretty amazing. I mean, how does it feel to go from, I had this thought and I wanted to, you know, start blogging and sharing to I'm holding my book baby in my hands. What does that feel like? <laughs> it's totally insane really, because I never set out to write a book, right? You know, I, I just needed to write. And yes. um, so let's start there. You needed to write. So what was the, you know, give us a little bit of a background and how, how you, you know, where this came from and how it came to be. That's a great place to start because it's such an interesting story. Well, you know, I, I just poke fun of myself a little bit, because, just a little bit, because I found myself just in at, at the bottom of a well, just in the worst place I'd ever been. And uh, my solution to that was to go on social media and tell everybody that I was going to write a post about gratitude every day for a year. And, um, you know, looking back at that, I love it when people do gratitude posts. I read them. I think it's a lovely gesture. I think it's a great thing to do, you know, personally, if you have a little journal at home. But to think that that was what I needed is so I was so not in tune with my own self uh, as far as like, I think, so what I figured out later is I really thought that if I could just make myself feel grateful that I didn't have to deal with grief because I didn't think I could be in both of those places at the same time. That is such an interesting thing. I just wrote a post myself you know, we've been having some personal things in our, in our lives right now. And this idea that you can hold both grief and joy or sadness and joy, or, um, you know, fear, which is a tough one to hold anything else when you have fear, but, but that's life now, especially as we get older, things are, they hit us. And maybe, maybe they were always hitting us. Maybe even when we were younger, that was all going on around us, but we just didn't have the vision and the insight and the, you know, the broad perspective to see it but I'm really noticing it now and I'm really thinking how do we live in both of these spaces and I think just the one isn't the whole story nor is just the other you know and so I think that's that's such an interesting exploration all right so you started writing switched gears and then started writing really truthfully yeah. about your own feelings and what happened then I think um, you probably got a better response even to that well, it was amazing because there were just so many people around me who could relate exactly to what I was writing, right. uh, even if their particular life experiences were different than what I was writing about, it's still grief, it's still pain, it's still sadness, yeah. it's still overwhelm, all of those things. And so people, it really resonated with people. And also, you know, you get the reaction of, uh, I didn't know how to articulate this, like, how, these are this is exactly how I'm feeling. And you put it exactly the way that it needed to be said, or I can't believe you're saying these things publicly. <laughs> that reaction too, but. I know, uh, right? So was, you're writing a memoir, so it's all out it was, there. <laughs> yeah, it was connection. It was, it was connection. And um, that's really what I needed was to tell the truth and to feel like I wasn't alone. Yeah, and it was cathartic for you, I'm sure, but it was also probably 
just really beautiful for other people to find it and say, oh, I, somebody else understands, you know? So the, 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 um, the thing that sort of pushed you into writing was the loss of your dad, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. sort of processing that grief. And then during the course of that time, some other things have happened in your world, which were upsetting and um, we'll, we'll call it more than upsetting. I don't, I don't have a good word for it, but disruptive, um, life-changing, whatever. Yeah. So if you want to just talk a little bit about the pieces that you address in your story, in your memoir, because it does read like a story sometimes, you know, <laughs> which any good storyteller uh, makes yeah. it read like, you know, it just pulls you right in and keeps you there. And, and then you get to have the out breath at the end. So um, if you don't mind, just so our folks that are thinking about purchasing or just want to know more about you can have a little sense of what, what you were dealing with. Sure. So, you know, it was sort of this, um, I guess it was sort of a slow unraveling at the time. And I feel like my father's death just kind of pushed me right over the edge. <laughs> I was sort of like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh shit. I'm not fine. <laughs> and, um, so I went from being, um, a stay at home mom to two little girls to, um, you know, suddenly realizing we were in financial crisis and I couldn't do that anymore. And um, so I started a business, uh, went back to work after being home for five years, started a business. And so I'm, I'm not saying that this was a negative thing. It's been an amazing experience for me, but a big change. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. A big change. Um, and then uh, my, my marriage unraveled. And there's a lot to that story. Um, initially, my spouse came out to me as gay in our um, in a marriage counseling session. Um, and ultimately, through a period of time of about two years, uh, came out as transgender. So she um, so we went through that process as a family going through the divorce and then um, kind of adjusting to um, revelations as they happened and um, just making sure everyone was okay. And, um, you know, also at the same time, like trying to figure out who I was and what I was doing as a newly single mother of two, um, busy business owner. And um, so all of these things were going on and then my father, you know, he wasn't ill or anything, just passed yeah, away suddenly. suddenly. So it was just a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then other things happened in the course of me writing my blogging, which was interesting because it was sort of like, I came out of uh, that and felt like I sort of was in a good place with things and then other things unraveled. Right. So it was sort of, um, you know, uh, the memoir has some flashbacks in it where I go back and tell stories about things that happened before my dad died. Um, and then there were things happening in real time that were very impactful. Sure. It's, it's a lot. I mean, I always say, you know, I, cause I blog a lot too. It, life will bring us to our knees. It just will. We will not get out of it. We, we won't get out of it alive. <laughs> a. But worse, I think, is that it will bring us to our knees and we have to find a way back up. Um, and through and and to still find joy. And that is one of the things I wanted to make sure I said here and um, is that, you know, you touched on some really difficult things that we as a culture and a society, and you didn't choose to focus on that in your book. And I, I do understand why it was one of many things that you were, you know, going through at the time. But having a spouse say, I'm no longer comfortable in my, I've never been comfortable in my skin and suddenly I am something else. You know, it changes your relationship with them, who you see, you know, how you must have to rewrite the past a bit to say, oh, wait, now I understand some certain things, but also, gosh, um, that's the end of something, right? You know, and that's the end of a person you knew and loved in a way, right? Because now they're somebody partly new. Um, so I, I just think it's a fascinating conversation that the world needs to start having. And what I love about you and your work and why I was really eager to make sure we profile you is that you approach everything, regardless of how much pain you're in, no matter how, if you're angry, you still approach with love and you approach with an openness and a lot. And, and it's, it's about making sure people are okay, making sure you're okay, but making sure the people around you, your children, these people that you love in your life, your ex, you know, and 
that is just, that's a beautiful thing that many people can't get to, or it takes them a very long time to get to. And I just want to say, I noticed that it was something about you anyway, that it was not unexpected because I, I know you enough to know that that is how you show up in the world that, you know, so for that, I think your own attitude, even though that the, gra the gratitude we were talking about, there's the two sides, that piece shines through. Um, and it does give people a way to look at things, you know, because we are all going to fall to our knees at some point. We're going to get pushed there. We're going to get thrown there. We're going to get, and we're going to be like, oh, now we're in the hole. Why bother getting out of it? It's so deep. But you did, and you are. And I don't want to say you're on the other side of it because the journey of life never ends. And this is a journey that, you know, your children are part of and your extended family is part of. So, but where are you now in terms of your, uh, I don't want to say mental health status, but you know, like, uh, how, how are you coming to peace with these things? Can you talk a little bit about that side of it? Because that's the, that's the out breath that we all hope to also see when we follow someone on a journey like this is like, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is a, a, a place to be at peace somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so how long do we have? I feel like there were so many things that you just said that I was like, oh, you know, like I, so um, as I said, I didn't set out to write a book. And actually when I was writing um, online, uh, my spouse hadn't really fully come out as transgender. Uh, so I didn't write about that really initially when I was writing my blogs, but it, so, um, all of that was going on, um, but it is now uh, stories about that are interspersed in the book now. Um, <clears throat> when I was trying to get published or trying to find an agent, I had a lot of people telling me that the book that I needed to write was about having a, a transgender ex-spouse. And I really didn't want to do that. For one thing, I had already mostly written a book about grief. And also I just felt like I was not the authority on having a family member who is transgender. And we were still, and are still really in the thick of, of it. And um, when I say in the thick of it, I mean, just, <clears throat> actually I wouldn't say that we are in the thick of it anymore. I take that back. Um, but when I was writing it, we definitely were sure. and kind of going through a period of time when, um, we were still using male pronouns and, um, you know, there was just a lot of fluidity where I feel like at this point, it's very clear, um, that she very much goes by she and, um, and so I think for me, the biggest thing as far as, um, you know, handling or adjusting to the whole situation was just, I always want everyone to be okay. So it was really just focusing on making sure that my children were comfortable. And actually, um, I feel like of all the things that have happened in our lives over the last few years, um, this was not the big thing. And also why I didn't want it to be the focus of my book. It's, it's in the book because it's impossible for me to write a memoir particularly focusing on the last few years of my life without mentioning that small detail. But um, it hasn't been the focus. And I feel like we're living in a world right now. And I know our children uh, went to the same school. So I do realize we're in a little bit of a, maybe a kindness bubble at yes. Meadowbrook. <laughs> Happy bubble, <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, to them it's, it's not like it would have been when, when we were kids, right. Had our, you know, father come out as a woman. It's, it's, right. it's a different world that we're living in. Thank goodness. And, um, I don't know. I think, hmm. I, yeah, I was thinking about that too. Just that, um, the openness that the younger generation has, they're just more comfortable with it. Um, and I think that's true for, a, for any generation, the next generation, the next thing that we have to tackle as society or as humanity, that the younger ones are just more willing to be open to it and be like, oh, okay, that's how it is, you know? Um, and I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. And we do also live in our little Meadowbrook bubble in a way. Um, yeah. But still, 
you know, the impact is a lot. It changes, changes hard. It can be, uh, uh, you know, well, it's, it actually, requires. So this is something that you touched on before that I just wanted to, I just remembered I wanted to say. You said something about, you know, kind of going back and rewrite, rewriting, you know, like the life before and like looking at it through a new lens and all of that. And I feel like for me, uh, that wasn't really a big part of it. It was really more, um, I felt like my spouse had died. Um, and that was very difficult. And um, that really hit me really hard one day. And I, it's one of the stories that I write about in the book of sort of that moment of like, just feeling like we, like I had experienced a death of the person that I had married. Um, but then, you know, I just came to realize ultimately that um, she still infuriates me the same way <laughs> and she still makes me laugh so hard. She's a very funny person. And, um, and she's still she, here for your children. In person, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like, I yeah. feel like that Again, like I'm not the authority on mm -hmm. having a transgender loved one, but I think that was my experience was feeling like the person that I loved had been taken away um, and then realizing, nope. Because you had that to compare there. to the person who really was taken away, you know, and that was a real experience happening at the same time. It reminds me, it's a funny story. My mom grew up in a very old school Italian Catholic household and got pregnant with me when she and my dad were 19. And so not married and whatever, and terrified to go and tell her father. And my grandmother also was terrified to go and tell grandpa, you know, or dad, because that just was, you know, back in the day, that was a bad, a big, bad thing, especially in that community. And my grandfather had been through World War II. He was a young man fighting in World War II, had PTSD. A lot of things went on in that family that whatever, that's their story. But when, when my grandmother finally sat him down you know, and he could tell they had something to tell him, you know, it was going to be big and it was going to be, and they said, Marsha's pregnant and she's having a baby. And he was like, oh, I thought someone was died. I thought someone had died. <laughs> it's like, we can do any, you know, anything aside from that we can work with. And for this guy back then to say that thing in that moment was for, I think my parents, of course, life-changing because, or it could have made a, a, a challenging situation much worse, but but I always remember that. And I think in the moment it feels like death, but it isn't. And so if we still have that person and we still have the love, we have something, right? And I think yeah. you, you really expressed that, uh, you know, or I feel like that's who you are. That's how you show up to things. But of course, you know, there's, we got to give ourselves the moment, you know, like we deserve the moment of wait, wait a minute, what? <laughs> And I think um, for me, you know, I was sort of thinking about this yesterday, um, the fact that, you know, we went through, um, you know, this coming out, this, this change of um, male to female, of course, she felt she'd always been female and, um, but to be letting us know that. Right. And then um, having lost my dad, I feel like I was just, it was like th the one thing was fine and then the next thing happened. And I think it's because of the way that I was raised where my father was sort of, you know, the center of the household, extremely humble man, but you know, we all just adored him so much that um, he was a little bit on a pedestal, I think. And um, so then also when I got married, my idea of how my life was going to be was, you know, my husband was um, going to be providing for us. I, I wanted to be a stay at home mom. You know, I had these two girls. So it was like um, the falling apart of that. And then, um, and then, so essentially losing my husband and then losing my husband in another way, and then losing my dad, it was like all of the masculine in my life was interesting, gone. Right? and yeah. it was such a feeling of imbalance um but it's funny because I, it, it started to get a little hysterical like just looking at the feminine in my life and like obviously Bethany this is what you need to wake up to and embrace the power of like you're a 
female business owner, you employ 12 women, you have two daughters, right. you have this amazing mother. Um, and then I actually bought a house a couple of years ago from two women wow. and they have taken such amazing care of this house. I mean, and they've come over a few times to help me with things. You know, these are two women in their seventies and it was just like, you know, the women are everywhere. Like right. <laughs> seize their power and like, understand that this is like, you don't need to have this patriarchal setup in your life. And right. um, so that was just kind of, I don't know, an interesting side note of my story is sort of- Yeah, the power of, yeah, but, but of your own strength women. that you had to draw on. Because you know, at the end of the day, we walk up this path with people, but our journey is our own. Mm -hmm. And the pain that lives is ours. And, and in community, I think it becomes less to, less to bear, but it's still our own. And so it's, uh, you know, digging deep and finding that piece of yourself and, and seeing it and then, and then probably seeing it in, in the, the women around you is what, well, that's just a beautiful thing. But um, so I wanted to ask speaking up to the fact that I didn't need I didn't need someone to take care of me. You didn't need someone to take care of you. And you might want to. We might still love the feeling of being taken care of, but we don't have to be taken care of. You're smart, strong. You did amazing. You know, you have an amazing business. You have an amazing family. Yeah, it's all it's, it's there. It's just wow. It's well, quite a journey. Think, yeah. And I think also I want to amend that by saying, um, that, that's not entirely accurate because I feel like my entire book is about people taking care of me, <laughs> or, you know, um, and about me taking care of them. But yeah, it's all a community. It's a community. And we have a great community. You know, it's, it's it, for a community to go through things with. It's a beautiful one, you know, um, to walk, have people walk next to you. So I did want to ask you a little bit about, do you have any plans to write anything else? Are you, are you going to continue your, you have a writer's voice, independent of writing a memoir or, you know, people either do or they don't, and you do, you know, mm -hmm. you have that, that, that gift of, of the writer's voice. Do you have any desire to keep on going with your writing career on the side, <laughs> maybe? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love to write and uh, I definitely realize, and you can probably appreciate this, if I, if I force myself to write, I, I can write, you know, but it's like, I could go months without writing about something if I don't um, make the time. One thing that came up when I was um, doing an interview the other day is just the fact that because I committed to doing this, you know, as I said, I committed to doing the year long gratitude um, posts, which isn't really what I did, but I did actually post almost every day for an entire year uh, and, you know, committed to doing that. And um, what it forced me to do was be very aware and awake and really listening to what people were saying and, you know, looking around me at, you know, what was happening and just paying attention. And I think there is, you know, so much rich richness all around us all the time in life that, you know, maybe we don't always pay attention to, but if you wake up in the morning and you think, what am I going to write about today? Um, it sort of forces you into that, you know, mindfulness mode, I guess. Yep. Um, so I think, yes, I love to write when I'm inspired to do it. Um, I think if I, if I were going to do another book, I definitely need to, um, be more disciplined and um, <laughs> sort of, make myself do it yeah um, but it well, is everything becomes a chore after you know when it becomes work it's work <laughs> even it's, if it's our it's creative work chore. it's still it's like never a chore it's <laughs> it, it is it really never is a chore and it's it's um one of those things that like once i sit down to do it i'm like obsessed with it mm -hmm. especially if i have you know i really am like oh this is this came to me and this is the message i really want to come across with and um it's like you know, just playing with all those words and moving them around and, and yep. you know, making them dance for you, I suppose, is a good um, metaphor, yes. but it's, I love it, but I do. Good, good. <laughs> it's like going to yoga. You don't yes. really want to go, but. And then you, you go know. and you're glad you did. And, and, <laughs> and, and I like, often get my. I love this. Why don't I, I do here. this every day? <laughs> exactly. This is so good for me. And I often will go, I'll go on Monday 
to yoga class because I have to write my Monday musings on Monday. And I'm like, I got nothing to write. I have nothing in my head. Nothing is happening. I don't feel anything. I'm just lame, you know, and then I'll go and, you know, there'll be something. She'll say something. There'll be another person there. There'll be an interaction. Suddenly I've got it, you know, and it's just because I'm alone in my own head is just bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do it, you know? And so, yeah. But anyways, I think that this is, it, you know, a lovely uh, sampling for our viewers, readers um, of your work and you. And I hope that meeting you will get them to go out and buy your book because it's a really worthwhile thing to read and to share. And you're so accessible too. Are you on um, any platforms people can come follow you, you know, on social media, such? I'm on Facebook at, uh, as Dipped in It. And I'm on Instagram as, um, I think it's Harvey underscore Bethany okay. under my name. Right. Okay. One last thing, just tell us why the dipped in it. I love the title and I love the story. So oh, it's, it's a great, um, it's a great thing. It was an expression that my father used to use to say like, you're, you're really lucky. You know, he would use it when you pulled out an unexpected victory or something like, Oh, you're so dipped in it. He would say it to me all the time when we were, you know, we playing Parcheesi or something, you know, like yeah. and I'd roll the doubles that kind of thing. Um, so it, it ends, it's a little bit of an ironic title. Right, <laughs> I was gonna say, because <laughs> dipped in a little bit of something else now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so yeah, a little a little play there on yeah. um, luck and gratitude and feeling soaked in things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a great title. So I just wanted to highlight that. But Bethany, thank you so much for being here with us today and good luck with your sales and with your uh, future interviews and tour. And thank you for sharing and being so open about such difficult things that, you know, we as humans, we struggle and it's lovely to know someone else gets it and they're there and we can actually walk the path together, even though we do, again, it's our journey, but it's nice to know we're not alone on that. So thank you again and best of luck. Thank you, Tabitha.